Hey Frog God fans, thank you so much for watching us today. Do you want to see more content? Make sure you subscribe and click that little bell button to be notified. Don't forget to leave a comment about the content that you want to see on the channel. And if you want to keep up with Frog God game releases, check out the links in the description below for Facebook, Twitter, and Discord. And if you want to see more content from Brandon and myself, check us out on Babies with Knives podcast, where we focus on character creation, crash courses, and actual plays for a wide variety of tabletop role-playing games. And everybody, remember, have fun in the pond. Hi, Frog God fans. Today, we're going to be speaking with Ken Spencer above me. Hi, Ken. Hello, Alice. Hello, Brandon. Hi, nice to meet you. So glad that you could come and join us. We're going to be talking to you about the Hall of the Rainbow Mage. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to more information about this. I'm Alice Peng, a.k.a. Lala Twiddle, and below me is Brandon Powers. Howdy, howdy, everybody. And Ken, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I know we're here to talk about Hall of the Rainbow Mage, but... Um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I broke that out because, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I have not read it yet, but um, I am very excited to uh, find time to crack into that because I just love that uh, that kind of feel for, uh, for a setting, so. Well, thank you. It's based largely off of the Nordic sagas, uh, a little more modern fantasized to, to suit the uh, Pathfinder and Sword and Wizardry system. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's an epic journey through a fantasy Viking land. Ooh, I, I can't wait to play that. Uh, Brandon's hogging that book in the other room right now, so I can't have it in my hands. <laughs> but um, so as I understand it, Patrick Lawringer is the author of this, but you are the conversion person, correct? Yes. Awesome. Yes, the adventure was written uh, back in 3.0 day, so... For a lot of folks out there, that's going to be way back in the gaming history. Yeah, it's and, uh, 18 years ago based on uh, a quick search on Google. 18, wow. Uh, okay, so yeah, 18 okay. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so written 18 years ago, uh, 3.0 was the system. So they handed it, Frog God handed it to me and said, can you make this into a 5e adventure? And I sat down and took it apart and put it back together with a new system. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about what the adventure entails? I'm Yes. Uh, so a powerful mage named Londor, Londar has disappeared. Uh, the PCs, through one of a choice of several hooks, need to go find out what happened to him. And that's the impetus for it. It spirals from there into a much larger adventure. Uh, first off... There's finding out a little investigation of what happened to him and then visiting his mansion, the Hall of the Rainbow Mage, which is not just a mansion. There's a mansion. There's a wizard's tower. He's carved out caverns underneath, some of them large enough to have their own ecosystems and that he's magically imported creatures from other worlds to live and interact there. And from there, it goes on to locating a magical artifact. Oh, that it sounds, sounds like, like a, a real throwback to some of uh, where the roots of Dungeons and Dragons came from on just, you know, the, you know, you're going to a mage's home there, then there's all sorts of crazy different uh, creatures that have inhabited a fairly small locale. Is it kind of a, a homage to that kind of adventuring? There's a bit of old school feel to it. Uh, very site based adventure. Uh, I wouldn't really call, so much call it a dungeon crawl. Uh, as much as, well, there are reasons for everything there. There's a backstory that links it all together. And it starts off, it looks like it's going to be a very small thing. Let's check out this mansion. Let's see what's going on. But as you explore more of the site, you find out there's more of the site to explore. So it sort of unfolds around you as you explore it. Well, that look, sounds really interesting. I love adventures like that, and I love investigating and exploring the supernatural in adventures. So this sounds like an adventure that would be a lot of fun. About how many pages is it? Ooh, the finished one, I can't tell you for sure. I haven't seen the, the finished file. Uh, the original adventure was 94 pages. So yeah. taking into account the differences between the two systems, so probably still around 90 pages. Okay. A 5e stat block is shorter than a 3.0 stat block, but not by a whole lot. 
So it's going to give people a good amount of play, you know? Uh, it sounds oh, like a oh good 20-some yeah. hours. Gets, oh, yeah. Tons yeah. of game <laughs> sessions, depending on how long you play. Mm -hmm. uh, I generally aim, when I do my own writing, I try and aim towards assuming a uh, five-hour effective game session, mm -hmm. which we all know could be like eight hours sitting there, but still, five <laughs> effective hours. Yes. Uh, so yeah. I could say this definitely four or five sessions, maybe more, depending on, on how many of the side paths you end up following, how deep in the exploration you go. Awesome. Well, I'm going to show our viewers the Indiegogo, which launched August 13th, and it's going to be going for a few days. So it's going to be going for about two weeks and show them about, a bit about the art and such. What are your favorite parts about this module? I liked how uh, with the mansion, there's another, I don't want to give away too many secrets. There's, of course, don't give away too much. There's please. multiple plot lines going on at the same time within the adventure. Mm -hmm. And when you think that you've wrapped it up, if you haven't resolved all of these plot lines or even discovered all of the plot lines, they come back around. Yeah, oh it's this idea. Yeah, it's this idea that it's not as linear as it might appear at the start. Okay, well, based on everything I'm hearing so far, this is a module that I'm going to be running very soon, as soon as I get my hands on it. I don't have a copy of it at the moment, but I will soon. <laughs> and I'm going to find people to run it for, because this sounds like exactly up my alley. That sounds, uh, yeah, I, I like the the sound of this and... By all means, that's a pretty nice, hefty adventure at uh, around 90 pages on the the old version, whatever that comes out to. Do you know uh, what systems we're putting it out in? Uh, I did the 5e. Um, yes, Alice, you, you have the Indiegogo page <laughs> up, so you can probably answer that. I do. I did the 5e it's conversion. Gonna it's going to be 5e, Swords and Wizardry, and Pathfinder. And it's going to be a small print run. So people really want to go and hit that Indiegogo, put in as much money as they want for the copies that they want, because it's not going to be one that's going to be big or unlimited. And so if this intrigues you, definitely go and pick up your system, more, one or more. So you spoke briefly about there's a, a couple different paths that, to get you interested in um, going on this quest for, you know, find the missing wizard. Um, for something that I've dealt with uh, with similar kind of veins, I really like that because you could get a couple disparate adventurer types that you haven't met up before or anything like that, but for various reasons that you're following this one thread and that gets you all involved together. Is that something that this one is doing or is the group kind of assumed to come from one of those paths? I think you could certainly do that because there are different parties who are interested in finding out what happened to Londar. So you could be working for the group could be split up amongst several different patrons and that would be able, that would generate uh, possibly a little bit of mild acceptable levels of inter-party conflict because you can't serve two masters. It's good to have, uh, it's good to have interactions where not everyone's getting along as long as you have mature players where it's not going off the rails. So that's, that's really cool. That sounds really awesome. The, I'm looking through the uh, Indiegogo right now, and the art for this is really nice. I've, it's really evocative of you know your imagination and such like that. I love the wizard that's flying in the air with Everett's tentacles, I would assume, because, come on, that's got to be Everett's <laughs> of the party. Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of the older art, although it was good, um, there's been a, a massive upgrade in the way fantasy art is done, especially since the uh, digital revolution. Mm. And Frog God's been great about doing that. And, you know, what, you said 18 years ago? Yeah, uh, 2002. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 2002 is another time. There's art styles that just aren't acceptable anymore. And they weren't acceptable then, but people were okay with it. Uh, and now it's certainly nothing that you want to print. Wow, because I mean, I was just flipping through the the old uh, book and was you know admiring uh, some of the pieces of art. Some of it, oh, there's great art in feels that. dated, but you know, some of these are just fantastic. And I was kind of hoping that you'd see, you know, whether they reprint art or not from this, but get maybe get homage pieces to some of these great ones. There's a, a fantastic one 
uh, in my opinion, just because it's uh, an evocative scene of your adventuring party coming across uh, some sort of, you know, weird monsters uh, in the in the cave, the cavern area. And uh, the the monsters just kind of seem straight out of a horror movie. They have this kind of melted skin doppelganger kind of look, but I don't oh, think they're yeah. doppelgangers. And no. I haven't read any of, you know, what any of the words in here, but it's just fantastic. Speaking of monsters, um, are there any particular uh, monster encounters that you really did enjoy in this? Uh, actually, one of the ones towards the end, I, I can't say too much about because I don't want to give it away. Um, but it presents as a very normal monster encounter, a, a very, here's a thing that's not human, that's looks strange, maybe, it, and it's threatening, we should fight it. And really and truly, it's a situation where uh, a wise player uh, or you know, people playing their characters well will state, hey, now, wait a second, they're threatening, but they're not attacking. What's the situation going on here? And it might lead to getting allies later on in the adventure, or it might lead to a situation where the party uh, party ends up overmatched and having to fall back. Did you find yourself challenged in any way trying to convert the Pathfinder to 5e stat blocks or creating new monsters for 5e in this? Um, with 3.0, one of the things you have to do is it's not a one-to-one -one conversion at all. Uh, the numbers, the power levels, those have all changed greatly over the additions. And one of the things you have to pay attention to is that uh, 3.0 Pathfinder, they rely heavily, especially with their monsters and traps, on ability sc score damage. That's a big thing. Um, on level drains. And that sort of stuff isn't really supported in 5e. 5e has moved away from those. And it aims for a simpler, faster style of play. So what you have to do is you have to go, okay, how can I make this monster just as dangerous and just as thematic, but it's not doing the same sort of mechanical things? What else can we do with it? And that was a big part of it. Um, and part of it always, whenever you're bringing up from an older edition, is double-checking the monsters that exist in the SRD did they carry through to this edition? Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, you'll find monsters where you go, hey, wait a second. <laughs> it, it's not here anymore. Or it's moved, you know, it's in fifth edition, like a blink dog, but oh it's no longer a major threat. Yes. I remember blink dogs. Yeah. Now they're a very much a low tier monster. They're not a major threat. Same with the displacer beast. Um, they're not the danger they used to be. So then you need to work around that when you're doing a conversion and look at, say, okay, what thematically monster will fit and that will fit the right CRs that we're looking at. Uh, it's much more than just going through and doing a finder place. Well, and that's kind of one of the, the places that uh, necromancer games really excelled at and you know a lot of people have their experiences with crucible of freya rap and athic and such but mm -hmm. to me where i what really made me notice necromancer games way back in the day was that tome of horrors because there were so many thematic monsters that to me screamed D D. Oh, yes. And then mm -hmm. weren't available and that WotC had no intention of putting out anytime soon. And I just remember after I got that, that I'm riding in the car, we have uh, some of our friends and they're all newer to D&D &D than, than I was. And I'm flipping through this and Axebeak was just a monster that's, uh, to me, I, I loved back, you know, the, the art mm -hmm. in the first edition monster manual. And I'm like literally cackling and I'm like, you guys just don't understand how much this means to me right now. <laughs> Well, and they're continuing to do that with the Tome of Horrors for 5e and Tome of Horrors 2020. Yes. Yep. Um, I'm... In fact, we just I just finished up doing a lot of conversions and new monster work for Tome of Horrors 2020. I think you'll really like what you're seeing in that one. I got a little sneak peek into some of it because I did some of the sensitivity reading, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes of it. I think it's really interesting and important how people do interpret different things when it comes to system conversions, because this goes to the idea of some people saying, well, 
I can't do this in X system. I can't do that in Y system. And then other people saying, well, you can do anything in any system mm. because it, and so seeing how you do it between systems, I think can really show people uh, that it is more versatile. It's just sometimes you need to be a little more creative and outside the box with it. Like you said, oh, the yeah. level drain's a huge thing in all, in 3X, but in 5E, they're like, no, let's not do that. People hate when they lose levels. Nope, exactly. I love it. <laughs> I, I honestly, I love that story. I know that I'm in the minority and I hate that the games have moved away from it. That, you know, you die, you come back and you've got a level marked off and not just, you know, that permanent neg level that uh, Pathfinder went to, but like, no, your experience went down. Uh, I'm in the minority, but to, to me, that's just part of I enjoyed game. it in first and second edition, uh, BECMI. It worked fine. I don't think it works that well from 3.0 on uh, because of the amount of recalculations. I don't want to have to say, okay, your character lost a level. Well, you're going to need 15 minutes to go through the character sheet and figure out what that means. Uh, Dropping everything down. Yeah, I think that's a funny, funny thing because... For us, we use PDFs and we use uh, character creators and such like that. So I learned from early on with the groups that I played with, uh, specific uh, with the GMs that I played with, and I'm glaring downwards right now, <laughs> that when I leveled, I never got rid of my old level version. <laughs> because oh. <laughs> So I would just have my you know previous levels all layered out in my thing. And therefore, if I something that like that did happen to me, which was very likely, I would just go, okay, well, here's my fourth level version. I'm here for a while. I've got my fifth later. And then when, I, so that's the nice thing about the technical age, right? You don't have oh, to yeah. do the, you can just save it. Oh yeah. But well, then again, I mean, so, I mean, that's what a binder does. Uh -huh. You could just yes. have them all in your binder. And exactly. I, I don't know, to me, I, I generally know uh, I'm obsessive. I, I, I follow that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm obsessive about so gaming I. and I generally will know where I am at one point And I keep, meticulous records on that kind of stuff. But. And to be fair, I'm the type of GM that hits people with neg levels. And this is probably going to get me in trouble. Lots of hate mail coming in. But I do. I do do the level drain. So when I interpret like stuff like chi, I interpret that as level drain, for example. So oh, OK. See, <laughs> I like in 5e, I like to take away hit dice. Well, Which see, that's kind of like level drain. Out of combat healing mechanic, right? Yeah. It's the out of combat healing mechanic, but it doesn't refresh like mm -hmm. after a long rest. You get back half of your lost hit dice mm. after a long rest. Um, and it can be a major issue, especially on a dungeon crawl, if you're losing those hit dice. Because now, even at a short rest, you can't spend it if it's gone. And when the long rest comes around, you're not getting back as much as you need. So that makes that choice to spend your hit die uh, much more... Uh, suspenseful choice yes and you, it makes your resources more limited which is uh something that some people think is uh a little too lenient in 5e is the resource pool and so that can shorten it a little bit give it a exactly. little challenge not to get off too much on a tangent or to uh continue with the tangent that we're on though it's very interesting to me um that's a it's a big divisive aspect in gaming for a lot of people some people think that you shouldn't really have any any major uh debuffs come up until the party might have the ability to cleanse that off if you're throwing curses around at people before they can have remove curse mm -hmm. that's kind of bad if you throw you know level drains in games that have them out and they don't have it to me it's like well once you have that ability to remove it you you've taken away so much of the story that does go along with that and so i i'm a, a proponent of by all means i mean you have to realize how tough that is to work with but it can make some really awesome stories when you have that mm -hmm. person who continues uh fighting the good fight and uh even though they've got these horrible curses level drains whatever one of my favorite ones to love in 5e is exhaustion because they've got a nice downward spiral with exhaustion. Uh, the six levels of exhaustion leading to death. Um, and your character's abilities decrease so rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, and although, yes, you can recover a level of exhaustion if you take a long rest, but if you manage to catch two or three of those during the day. It, it really, really becomes very difficult. Exactly. Uh, 
We need to close up soon, but before we go, sure. I do have a question for you. So I finally got my copy of the th uh, D20 version. I didn't realize I had it. I'm really excited because now I'm going to use it. Uh, I'm actually going to use it in an upcoming campaign I'm running uh, with the information in here. It fits very well with something I'm planning. But there's some new items and new spells and such, and more specifically the new spells like Rainbow Staff and Rainbow Spear. I was wondering if you converted all those spells as well to a 5e version, because Rainbow Staff sounds a lot like Chromatic Spheres and stuff. Uh, I believe so. Now, I worked on this over a year ago, so give me a oh, second okay. to... <laughs> Put you on the spot a little bit there. Rainbow Staff? Yeah, the Rainbow Staff spell. So in... In the 3.0 version, it's a Conjuration oh, yeah. Creation 5th level spell. Okay, cool. Yes, it is. Here it is. Yeah, it's been converted. Awesome. Well, I'd yeah, love usually that. I do all of the magic items and, and spells, too. I just want to double check, because every now and then you'll find something, you're like, no, this is either it, it was unsuitable then and it's unsuitable now, or it's a case of there's already something like that in 5e, mm -hmm. so you well, don't need to redo it. Well, this is the type of spell that goes right up my alley, so I I need to start finding ways to uh, get this spell into my campaigns. Thank you so much. Is Before we go, though, is there anything you'd like to make sure that our viewers know about the Indiegogo? Uh, I would say back it as soon as you can, um, and it is a limited print run, so make sure you get your copy if you want a print copy. Uh, and as a example is that uh, I had them hold off on one of uh, uh, Island of the Angry Apes. Uh, Frog God said, do you want your author's copies? And I said, not right now. Um, I've got an overfilled bookcase. I need to strip out the bookcases and move them to a new room anyway. So why don't we hold off? I have and a I, room. Do you have a room? <laughs> we have a, I have yes. a room. <laughs> uh, so I ended up holding off about uh, four months on uh, collecting my and requesting my author's copies because the way they do it, you send it through the web store and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So um, they don't set them aside for us. They just, you know, when you, if you want it, you order it. And I waited too long. Ooh. And yeah, I got the PDF. But uh, so if you want a copy of this, back the Indiegogo now. Request your copy now, or you're going to have to get a PDF, which is great. I use a lot of PDFs these days, but limited print run means limited print run. And, you know, having that hard copy, there's very little that replaces it. And yes, we have um, multiple rooms actually storing our games. Uh, the room that he's I have in. Multiple right? rooms you could send those books to. Yes. <laughs> we, you know, the old story of, you know, you put your stuff in a box and uh, I forget what the, oh gosh, I forgot the whole story. But for us, we rent our space from the box of games rather than the games running, renting the space from us. Our house is a box. Our house is a box. Our house is a box. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, we had to make room for, uh, there's three of us now at home, our kids home doing online school, wife's working from home. So we had to rearrange the office so all three of us could be in here at once. Wow. So we moved all the bookcases out to the living room. So now our living room is full of books. There's just a whole wall in this little space for a TV. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a true gamer's house. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ken, for stopping in and talking to us for a little bit. Uh, once we got warmed up, I think it was a really fun conversation and got to learn a lot about what uh, people should expect out of this book. I'm really excited to see more about it. And I can't wait to see your conversion for 5e. 5e is not one that I play too much of, but I do like reading it. It'll be a lot of fun. Thank you very much all for right, joining us. All right, it's been us. nice talking to you. Yeah. Nice talking to you as well. Nice talking Bye -bye to you. Bye-bye, all. Bye. Bye, viewers. Hey, Frog God fans. Thank you so much for watching us today. Do you want to see more content? Make sure you subscribe and click that little bell button to be notified. Don't forget to leave a comment about the content that you want to see on the channel. And if you want to keep up with Frog God game releases, check out the links in the description below for Facebook, Twitter, and Discord. And if you want to see more content from Brandon and myself, check us out on Babies with Knives podcast, where we focus on character creation, crash courses, and actual plays for a wide variety of tabletop role-playing games. And everybody, remember, have fun in the pond. <laughs>